Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. Perspective by Janelle Cordero When I opened the famous book of poetry from 1981, the cover split from the spine, shedding flakes of glue the color of butter. How strange it is to hold the book unadorned, just a stack of paper, the way any manuscript starts out before it's chosen for something better. Hi there, welcome to No Extra Words, the Flash Fiction Podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dersh, I'm your producer and editor. We're doing a bit of a special today, a Poetry Slam episode. So here's the story of me and poetry. I'm not a poet. I've written my share of bad poetry, you know, in my teenage years, but I'm not a poet. And I'm not a poetry expert. I'm a person who likes poetry. And I'm a person who, in my four years as a school librarian, became something of a poetry evangelist. I felt like it was my job to pull the National Poetry Month celebration all over my school. And so one of the things that I was inspired by is I spoke with a fellow educator and she said she wished kids were taught that poetry is more than just funny stuff that rhymes. Because if you think about children's poets, Shel Silverstein, Jack Prelutsky, that's what they are and that's what they do. And there's nothing wrong with Shel Silverstein or Jack Prelutsky and there's nothing wrong with bringing them into a National Poetry Month celebration, but it can be very limiting if that's all you do. There's a world of poetry out there. There are novels in verse, there are poems that rhyme, there are poems that don't rhyme, there's found poetry. And so that's what I tried to bring to my students, my elementary and middle school students during National Poetry Month. And that would include a lot of things. I had a lesson all written around African-American poetry and Langston Hughes that I would share with fourth graders, talking about the evolution of hip-hop and rap and jazz and how those all come together out of a poetry tradition. I would read Gertrude Stein to the third graders. I remember one third grade boy, after three members of his class had told him how stupid the poem was when I read them some Gertrude Stein, he said, well, you can't just listen to the words. You have to kind of just let them be noise, let them run over you. And I thought, you may know more about Gertrude Stein than a lot of people I know who have undergraduate degrees in English. I would always have the sixth graders try to come up with a definition of what poetry was. And that was hilarious to watch. I had one class have a very lengthy debate, and they decided that a poem is a poem because it has poemness. And I asked them what poemness is, and they said, you just know it when you see it. I had one student tell me a poem is a big bunch of words thrown together that somehow all relate. And none of those definitions are wrong. I think those are awesome definitions of poetry. And the day I think that I knew I had succeeded was over the course of one day I had a third grader write me a wonderful four line poem where every sentence every line ended with some word that rhymed with cat. I had a seventh grader write an acrostic on a murder mystery where the line the first word in each line spelled out who did it or who done it, I think. And then I had I wanna say a fourth grader write a two line poem called Failure to Write a Poem. And Somehow in that moment, I felt like I had succeeded, that I felt like I had spread this epidemic of poetry in the school to the kids. And I think people underestimate kids, and I think people underestimate adults in terms of the appreciation of poetry. For adults, I think we have the opposite problem that kids have. Rather than thinking that all poems have to rhyme and be funny, we think that all poems have to be very literary and very overwrought and convey lots of deep meaning. And some do, and that's fantastic. And some don't. Some are silly and some are ridiculous. There's a great book of found poetry that is all speeches made by Donald Rumsfeld during his tenure as, um, what was he? Secretary of, Secretary of Defense, I think. And there's a great book of found poetry that is all baseball calls made by Phil Rizzuto. Poetry's everywhere. It's everywhere. And as I was sorting through poems, trying to figure out what fits into this month's worth of episodes, I kept getting a lot of different poems that didn't fit so well, but were awesome because they represented some different part of poetry or they had a different sound to them or they had a different feel to them. And I thought, I need an episode that's my poetry 
catch-all drawer. And immediately I said, we need to do a poetry slam. Now, this isn't really a poetry slam. Poetry slams are competitive performance poetry events where you have a window of time to write and perform a poem. We used to do a community-based one in a library I used to work at. It was actually a lot of fun. You'd be given a topic, a word. I think you're given a word. You had to write a poem that somehow featured that word, and then you could perform it, and then there were judges and, and prizes. And it's a lot of fun. This is less intense. It's less competitive. But it is about the writing of the poems and the performing of the poems because this is an audible medium you're hearing them you're hearing them be performed either by the authors themselves or by yours truly and they all come together in a different way because they all relate somehow even though they don't but again this is a short story podcast and I had to put a short story in there so one of these pieces is a story one of these pieces came in as a flash fiction story one. There are six. And I'm not telling you which one. I'm going to get you now on to more pieces. And there is a poetry slam coming that is all this performance of poetry designed to shake you out of your comfort zone during this National Poetry Month. But hiding in there somewhere is a piece of prose. And I would love to know, do you know which one it is? Ellipses by Jacqueline Tan You were ellipses. You knew all the best ways of drifting off into silence. You had no rough edges. You were always waiting, always seeking, always discovering. You were closure in its most open-ended form. You were ellipses, but that is not why I let myself fall into the cracks of your silence. You see, I was a dash looking for somebody to complete my sentences, and you enthralled me with the way you had never been an unfinished clause, how you inserted meaning into every pause. The day I told you that I was a distraction, that I was a deviation from the main point, you said, look again, it is easy to mistake you for a dash, but you are a hyphen. You belong within the words, you tie them together. You are a postscript telling the world of a far-off, made-up land. Your dreaminess takes you not nowhere, but everywhere. You see, the day I let myself fill in the gaps in your speech, you'd picked up your runaway train of thought, led it slowly but surely back to its tracks, saying, you and I, we are not that different. Apollo by Devin Millette. A dog collar on your windshield, put there with an appearance of indifference, an appearance of uncaring. But you would be wrong, for this is the third time I have had to leave you a note, a rarity these days, but then again so are you, on your windshield, tucked under your wipers. The last note was washed out into mush in the rain before you could read it, while the one before was blown away in the wind. In the past, I had left more subtle hints, but you had ignored them. The first time you had done it, I had simply brushed off your ignorance as you being busy. I imagined someone who is as important as you is usually busy. That day, though, the one in the coffee shop, I was standing in line right in front of you, unable to avoid your gaze, even paid for your usual coffee order. For my effort, all I got was a thanks and a smile. At that point, I would have thought that you would understand me by then, that you would talk, have a conversation, tell me your dreams and aspirations. But you didn't. No. Every time you ignored my notes, my looks, the coffee. Even when I put myself directly in your path, with a setting of flowers and card, arranged just so on your doorstep, you had them thrown out and started to keep Alice and your dog inside. Unlike you, your dog Apollo was always affectionate towards me. He warmed up to me almost right away. He was putty in my hands, and even started to look forward to my visits while you were away at work. He would always wag his tail and welcome me home, welcome my ear scratches and my homemade dog treats. In fact, he just scarfed down about thirteen of them, and now he is sitting still in the back seat of my car. How cute he is. Kind of like you. Kid, I know some things we never outgrow. Chrissy Hind 
He is strong and he is honest. He needs variation. He is able to learn. He is not smooth, not tricky. He is not much of an operator with little real bitterness, a moonshot of protocol. He'd have us in a war in ten minutes. He stumbles and blunders like a bull and makes mistakes. He is a Vulcan in a china shop, followed by supple breezes, a respect he had never felt before. He intends to run everything down to earth. Angry tears are too dear. He is given suggestions to laugh like a commie, slowly and carefully, to write with absolute seriousness. He could have been overcome easy enough. He's no less immune to losing. He's lost twice already. Head on, he underestimates Zeus, that uncertain fire. He is a real prince among the usual coffee crowd, the last of a heavy burden. He has a rocking chair approach, a committee these days, angry and maudlin, a surprised and knowing objective. Perhaps, and perhaps not, there's only one answer: he is a great wind. We can stand that for a while. Everybody says so. Transoceanic Twitter, by Alex Dravich. Talkative tubes Twitter trigger transition to timely tighten to messen transmission. Ty Trotsky to Trudy, Tunisia to Tennessee. Trigger transparency, trashing tranquility. Take textual tadpoles to terrify to the late. Troglodytes talk, take to tolerance, transmigrate. Travelogues, tom tom toms, terrible tastelessness. Treasure troves, tongue tongs, trenchancy, tastiness. Two trillion text tatters twittering tirelessly, trading tirades, trueness, tape words, tomfoolery. Tattle torpedoes turn tiny trivialities to trash tornadoes, tumultuous tautologies. Take tessellations, take turns, take text tweezers. Trigger talk triple tripe tips. Take tipsy text teasers, tremulous toastmaster, titanic travesty, turning tricks, taking turns toughly, tempestuously. Travel tip by Alan Gerardo Kempler. Fold yourself into an onion paper thin square, and slip your whole body neatly into an airmail envelope. No stamp needed. Then address to Batman, Turkey, Bird in Hand, Pennsylvania, Chicken, Alaska, Christmas Pie, England, Once Brewed and Twice Brewed, Northumbria. Go, 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 Madagascar. Happy Adventure, Newfoundland. Nowhere else, Tasmania. Nameless, Tennessee. Inexpressible Island, Antarctica. St. Louis to Ha, Ha, Canada. Silly Department, Burkina Faso. Punky Doodles Corners, Ontario. Money More, Ireland. More Tomorrow, Belize. Wedding, Germany. Or even Lanfair Pilwilgogogotch. One of the most unpronounceable places in Wales or the world. Then drop your envelope into the mailbox. Hope for the best. And with any luck, you'll get to where you want to go. Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information on today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. The best support you can give the show is to recommend us to your family and friends. See you next time. <laughs>